Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, this is part of an event that is being organized by really just a group of people who have a uh, significant interest in learning analytics, educational data mining, really, how do we make sense of the world, especially the education and learning world through the use of data and uh, analytics techniques. As a result of this, we developed an organization that basically looks at the learning analytics learning network. We will uh, drop the link in. I think actually Justin just put it into the forum. If you want to have a look at previous events, upcoming events, we have an, a really nice slate of activities coming up over the next uh, six to eight months. We also have a good archive of activities that we've held in the past that you can access recordings and so on. Part of our goal is really just to foster the recognition of what's happening in learning analytics as a field and also to provide resources and supports for students and academics and others who are starting to pay attention to learning analytics and want, if for lack of a better word, a space in which to have dialogue and to learn new techniques or new approaches that are being utilized. I want to say a particular thank you to uh, Justin Dellinger and Florence Gabriel. Justin's with University of Texas at Arlington, uh, where there's a new Master of Science in Learning Analytics that's being launched fully online in uh, fall of 2021. And uh, Florence Gabriel is with uh, University of South Australia, Education Futures. And uh, we are uh, uh, you know, looking forward to getting the uh, community around and rallying, uh, supporting people who are moving into this space, for lack of a better word. Okay, so for today, we're pleased to uh, have a colleague, uh, Juan Pablo Sarmiento, Sarmiento join us. Um, he's a doctoral scholar at uh, the, I guess you'd call it the Learning Analytics Research Network or LEARN Lab out of NYU. Um, he's also involved in the Office of Student Success. And some of what he's gonna be talking about with us today around techniques for participatory design of learning analytics came from what ended up being a, you know, a best paper award uh, from the LAC 2020 practitioner track. So on that note, JP, I'm going to throw this over to you, mute my video and audio and pay attention to chat. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, we're trying to um, fix a, a little, uh, little issue. Um, so, um, Thank you very much for that introduction and, and welcome everyone. Um, so uh, this session is called Six Techniques for Participatory Design and Learning Analytics with Students and Teachers. And um, essentially what we're gonna be doing here is sharing kind of like a high level, a bunch of different tools and resources um, that you could use for learning analytics. Um, I, I framed this as kind of things that I would have liked to have known when I started doing participatory design um, in LA. And it's, um, it's a collection of just uh, methods that you know, have, have been collected from, from all sorts of different things and from our own practice at LEARN. Um, and, and in some cases tinkered or applied to, to learning analytics specifically. Some of the stuff here you know, is just used in human-centered design throughout. And some of it is specific for LA. Um, so <clears throat> uh, I come uh, as... Um, as, as George said, you know, from, uh, from NYU Learn, and, and we are a research network uh, with a lot of people uh, that from NYU, uh, and uh, we are, you know, trying to work in many, many uh, projects, uh, applied projects throughout the university um, to bring learning analytics uh, closer to people. And, and those are uh, designs for dashboards for instructors or for students. Um, uh, there's a lot of experimentation with multimodal learning analytics and um, also participatory uh, design. Um, and it's about participatory design that we're going to be talking about today. So the plan is, I will just share this, you know, a little bit about kind of human centered design, and then talk about these six tools in kind of three buckets. Um, uh, tools that are for understanding to kind of uh, gathering data and information before we design, uh, tools for co-design, for designing alongside our users, and tools to evaluate. Once we have worked with our users, how to bring how to bring them back um, and, and make the most out of out of um, out of getting their insights about you know whether what we have designed together able or or not. Now these are um, it's an introductory session. Okay, um, so depending on your level, um, you know you, you might want to kind of check how much value uh, this this is this is for you. So um, okay, I'm kind of already explaining that. <clears throat> um, and um, uh, there's a lot to cover today, so I might kind of seem to be going um, pretty fast. Um, by the way, uh, uh, Justin has shared a couple of, of uh, links uh, for a Jamboard. Uh, we're going to be doing kind of some active exercises as we are, as we are um, 
going through the session. Like the idea is to be trying to apply uh, this this information into um, into our own lives and into projects that you guys might have thought about developing um, yourselves. Okay, so the first question here is, you know, why are we putting the human and human centered design? So um, participatory design as a discipline kind of was was born in the in the sixties in in Germany and in Russia, and kind of the idea behind it was that, you know, technologies were being developed by developed, but workers were feeling very threatened um, by these technologies um, because these things were going to change and have a huge impact on, you know, kind of how their workplaces looked, um, whether they would have work, what their work would look like. Um, and, and they had very little, they felt they had very little control about, you know, kind of what actually was being built and, and, and how these innovations were being imposed um, upon them. So, um, so what, what these designers did was to actually bring those, those participants, um, those workers into the fold, into the processes of designing tools for, for themselves. And, and the two kind of arguments here, um, one, uh, why we do this human-centered design thing, um, one is, is just because it creates better designs. You know? uh, designers work with assumptions, um, particularly if, uh, if we're talking about technology, the more specialized we are, the more we look at the world in a skewed manner. And, um, and things that might seem simple and obvious for us may not seem simple or obvious at all for the people that we are designing for. Uh, about a lot of learning analytics tools that you know, seem to have very sound design, but that when they're rolled out are just too abstruse or just don't fit well um, in, the, in, in the lives of the, of the people that they're supposed to help. Um, and the second argument is just a humane technology argument. You know, kind of maybe the reason why um, we're bringing participatory design is just because we think that these tools should be designed by the people who are going to be impacted by them the most um, so that we don't forget, so, so, to, so as to create accountability. Anyway, um, this is easier said than done, of course, and there's a lot of challenges when we are bringing stakeholders into our processes. Um, like how do we ensure participation is authentic? How do we kind of create a ground where hierarchies are you know, dealt with? Um, how do we create trust? If say I'm a professor and I'm trying to work with a student, um, there's always some antagonism there. How do we synthesize the information that comes from these processes? You know, you, you create a workshop, you, you record the data, and then you just have mountains of data to deal with when you're creating your designs. Well, how do we, um, how do we parse that in an efficient manner? Um, and, and also, um, because many of the, of the times when we actually bring stakeholders, it's through workshops or through, you know, um, kind of limited interactions. How do we do it so that those meeting points are efficient and engaging for everybody involved? Um, so, <clears throat> as I said before, I want you guys to try to be thinking about one innovation um, and throughout the different tools, what we're going to be doing is actually trying to think about applying some of these tools to the to the learning analytics innovation that you know that you that you dream of. Um, so uh, if you could all go to the to the Jamboard, um, uh, which looks something like this. And uh, yeah, just uh, choose one of these workspaces and uh, start creating post-its um, and kind of like write in one or two sentences, a learning analytics innovation that you are working on that you have worked with um, or uh, that, you know, that you might fantasize about, you know, it can be something general like helping a teacher dealing with a, you know, with a, with a, with a really large cohort um, classroom. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys um, three minutes to do that. And I can see people coming in. That's great. Uh, it's, uh, you, you're going to have to scroll through like the third slide of the Jamboard, by the way.
Okay, I see somebody who wants to create a chatbot, multimodal learning analytics for collaborative learning. It's exciting stuff. Don't overthink it, okay? Just, uh, you know, kind of one or, it, it, can, it can just be a description of one or two words. Just choose um, your square and, and uh, we only have if, you access can't edit, okay. If it's uh, on the second one, the first one was fine. Okay, thank you so much for that. I'm gonna. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. So try refreshing and seeing if uh, see if now you can over the link. Oh, and that's it. Thank you, I'm sorry for that hiccup. Okay, great. Understanding differences between technologies and choosing them wisely, uh, a nudge that encourages students to participate in the digital learning environment. Great. By the way, there's there's many, many pages. So if you see, if, if all of the boxes are, are filled, you just kind of like move uh, move over to the next box. Uh, do it as post-its because you're going to be writing more on 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 each of these uh, spaces. Okay. Um, <clears throat> because we have limited time, I'm just going to move on. Feel free to you know continue writing as I as I go. Um, so now we're going to go into this uh, these six um, participatory design or human-centered design tools. Um, the first one is one that. Uh, is familiar uh, maybe to many of you. Um, it has been used a lot in learning analytics design and it's a context contextual inquiry, uh, which is a method of inquiry that borrows from ethnography. Um, and essentially what we do is we have the designer observe from the learners and the user. Um, its superpower is that it allows your designer researchers to challenge their assumptions about stakeholders and, and better understand how the tools that we're creating can fit into our stakeholders' lives. Um, and, and here an important thing, like uh, even though it's used a lot, sometimes it's, sometimes we learning analytics researchers describe contextual inquiry, things that are not contextual inquiry, like, you know, doing user interviews is, is a way of bringing information, but, it, but it's not really contextual inquiry. Because um, the essence of contextual inquiry is we are actually looking at, at users in their context. Uh, the designer researcher will act like the apprentice uh, of the user. We will follow them around and we will look at their practices and we look at their routines and try to kind of like see where, you know, our tools or our innovations can fit within their lives. Um, an example, you know, say we have a professor uh, or a teacher that has to orchestrate things in a really, really large classroom. Um, you know, we would probably start kind of uh, looking at them in that classroom, look at the kind of data that they have in that classroom, um, follow them home if we can, and, and kind of see where else they work. And, and, and seeing all of those routines kind of get an understanding of, of where it is that we can improve um, in their practice. Um, now there's key questions around kind of contextual inquiry, you know, kind of what are the routines of our user? Uh, what are some of the challenges, pain points that our user has? And really important, you know, what are data points? Um, what is the data that we need? What is the data that exists already that we can bring in? Um, and what are other data traces that might be possible to get and but that, you know, would be really valuable um, from, um, from them to actually create something, something valuable. So these are the kinds of things that we will be thinking about as we you know, follow them around. Um, now, one really important thing is that, as I said, the, the, the researcher should be an apprentice. You know, that we are learning from the other, and the expert here is, is not you know, um, uh, JP Sarmiento with, you know, with, with a PhD degree. The expert is actually that teacher, because uh, they are the experts in their lives and in, and in how data fits into their lives. 
Okay, great. Um, so now to try to kind of apply um, this, this idea, um, just very simply, I want you guys to kind of like go back to your post-it and put another post-it next to it, where you identify one or more stakeholders in your project. Stakeholders are the people who are going to be impacted by your project. Um, so say we're creating a learning analytics tools for, um, I don't know, for bringing the student data of a teacher. One stakeholder would be your teacher, but actually students are stakeholders as well. So think about two or three stakeholders and then um, ask yourselves one or two questions about activities and routines that will be important to know around this data tool that you're creating um, with the stakeholder. I'm gonna give you guys, uh, again, um, three minutes starting now. Some really, really interesting things coming in here. So remember, add like some question that you would like to ask them. For example, we have here somebody asking a question, how do these teachers teach? Um, okay, um, and then the follow up to that question is like, you know, what, what do we mean by how do they teach? Like, is it when are they teaching? What it is that their objectives for their teaching are, you know? Here we have a, another um, user who has actually gone really, really deeply into, into thinking about many different stakeholders. Um, they're creating a multimodal learning analytics for collaborative learning. And they're putting learning, communication psychologists, content creators, teachers, HCI researchers, educators. And, and that's really important, right? The, the tools that we create impact a myriad of, of, uh, of stakeholders, right? It, it's, it's not only who's going to be using our tool, um, often the impact goes way beyond. There's a lot of other people who are involved in the process. Great work. All right, and that is time. Okay, um, so now moving over to the second tool. Uh, I know that this feels uh, you know, fast, but as, as again, my, my objective here is to kind of share uh, high level all of these different kind of tools that we can use for participatory design. Um, so the next one is, a, is another one that's very often used, but here I'm, I'm gonna share with a twist. Persona building um, is very, very used in, in, in user interaction. It's a design method that has brought in has been brought in from storytelling, um, where we're creating a character and, um, and, and essentially kind of trying to flesh out this character so that we can design for somebody specific. So now our persona, um, our stakeholder, instead of being a teacher, becomes, you know, um, a Marie-Lise uh, Escudero, okay? Um, and, and it's this particular teacher that we're getting to know and, and who we're fleshing out to really, really understand their particular needs. Because the idea is, you know, that when we represent the needs of one or two key stakeholders, we actually end up representing the world. And it gives us a lot of like nuance and texture um, around many of the other people who, who might eventually use this tool. Um, and the superpower of this is that, you know, it both acts as an inspiration for our tools when we're kind of thinking about the routines and kind of where this fits, but it's also a checking mechanism. Because um, once we get we, we move apart from stakeholders, we um, we often start kind of forgetting about these uh, these things that we start designing for ourselves. So um, as we are designing, 
we can always go back to this persona that we're creating and check you know, whether the decisions that we're making actually would track back to this person that we, that we built in the beginning. Um, and how it works uh, at its most basic, it's a canvas of relevant information that we want from, from this user. Um, now, here is, is one example of, of one uh, persona. Don't worry, I'm gonna go back to the, to the last slide. Um, but I want you to look at the, at the bottom side of this uh, particular persona canvas. And, and, and what it kind of asks is, uh, it asks of us as researchers to kind of bring in what are some of the data points uh, that this persona can, can um, uh, data points that are interesting about this persona? Like, what are they saying? If we're interviewing, if we're interviewing them, you know, what are the actual quotes that bring, or that bring us information? What are they seeing? What's in their world? You know, kind of what are other tools that they're working with? What are the tools that they, uh, that form part of their routines? What they see, for example, in a classroom for that multimodal learning analytics? What it is that we see that they're doing um, in those spaces? what it is that they hear and, and how they perceive themselves based on what others are perceiving of them. Um, and from that first level of just kind of descriptive data, um, as a researcher, we start kind of building insights. And from those insights, we build, we, we make design decisions. So um, from the first level of data, um, as you see here on the bottom, you know, you have the observations that, that build data points that leads, leads us to, to find insights, like what are their pain points? Uh, or what are areas where we might want to improve uh, this persona's against. And that then leads us to design considerations. For example, uh, we had that teacher, um, but one of their pain points is that there's too many students, um, you know, and they cannot really deal with uh, how to take attendance in this really, really large classroom. Okay, good. Um, maybe we can actually create a tool that, that does that um, automatically um, and maybe because we saw that all of their students have cell phones, you know, we can, we can use that um, in, in the process. Um, was that a persona for the Jaguar team? I'm not sure I get that question. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, so this is an example of another persona. Uh, this is a UX persona. It's kind of like more pared down. But as you see, kind of it has some of the essential information um, that, that can help us, you know, understand this, this user. Now, one twist that, uh, that, that we have found to be very um, powerful is uh, that maybe this persona can actually be designed in a participatory process with um, some of our users. So um, the images that I'm sharing now is, is of a process of persona creation that we did with students for a learning dashboard for students at NYU. And what we did was, was uh, researchers interviewed uh, a bunch of students to kind of get their pain points regarding their experience at the university. And uh, we synthesized those into like a couple of, you know, kind of personas that had some challenges. Um, but instead of building those personas out, we simply just took a few uh, quotes that, that, um, that, that represented what they, uh, what they were, you know, kind of like the, the here part. And then um, also some of the things that these people were doing, their do part. And we share this information with other students, which are the ones that you see here in the photo. And we had them create personas based on those uh, first few bits of information. And what we found was that these students were actually very, very insightful at creating these personas. And they, and they brought in a lot of way more nuanced insights than us researchers had brought in from the, from the first group of 16 interviews. Um, and this is, you know, kind of, kind of logic. Um, they know other students like themselves and, and they can bring in their own experiences and the experiences of a lot of other students that they know into the fold. Um, so, so they came up with some really, really uh, interesting fleshed out personas that, that, that led to some really interesting uh, design insights later on in the process. Okay, so uh, on to our next activity. Um, again, I'm counting three minutes. Uh, it's there on the bottom in green. Um, now, using the stakeholders that you have created, try to write down two or three questions that you would like to more, know more about this, uh, one or two of those stakeholders. You know, if, if you were looking at this persona, what would you like to know about them? Um, thanks, JP. While, while they're doing that, just to queue up to mm -hmm. a, question, a question that was asked, two questions actually. One was, uh, will a copy of the slides be made available? So once people return. 
And the other question, which I believe you addressed, but was answered just before you went through your explanation, but Dana asked specifically, do you construct these personas based on literature or are they based on sort of real life uh, user traits? So I guess once this activity is done, if you can tackle those two questions. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of uh, ways and, and thank you so much for, for that question. Um, there's, uh, uh, so you can do it based on research. One way that a lot of people, a lot of designers construct personas is by starting first doing user interviews or stakeholder interviews, you identify some stakeholders, um, you know, recruit them, um, bring them in and do like a couple of, you know, one to two hour interviews and, and get that data. Um, a contextual inquiry process also is, you know, is, is great material to, to build a persona. If you've been following, you know, one or two of your stakeholders around, you know, that's information that you can then uh, use to build that persona. There's uh, some work that I can try to find out towards the end of this, if you remind me, uh, about actually using quantified methodologies to to build personas. So um, you know you 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 know kind of what are some of the essential routines of uh, of some of your of some of your users, um, and and then you actually use the data that systems like you know LMSs are are bringing in to generate these insights or, or to kind of like uh, develop uh, more more sophisticated insights, um, especially right now with uh, with systems like Starfish that kind of get a lot of nuanced data around the interactions that students have with advisors or other parts of the university, um, you can actually, you know, start building personas with uh, with some of that data that is simply being generated through through the system. Starfish, by the way, uh, for those who are not familiar with, uh, is a system that. Um, it, it works for advising and to kind of like um, for early detection of students that might have challenges within a university. So it tracks uh, the interactions that students have with uh, with advising teams, um, and also advising teams constantly create reports about those students. So it creates a lot of transparency across the the systems uh, within a university and administered systems. What was the second question, Justin? I'm so sorry. I, I... Uh, second question was related to whether you could share the slides. Oh, of course. Yes, yes. <laughs> we will share the slides. Okay, great. Um, so we're on time. Let me see what's coming up. Okay, great. How do students respond to different types of feedback? That's, you know, super valuable. Um, students, how do you feel about specific aspects of the courses? Great. Some of these questions are great, guys. Uh, yeah. Uh, and. Um, one thing that, that I would try to kind of, oh, I would start to remind myself when I'm working through these things is to try to empathize with, uh, with my stakeholder, you know, kind of try to put myself, we, we as, as teachers and as academics have certain, you know, needs, we, we want them to learn. Um, but a lot of this work is actually try to put ourselves in, in, in their feet and kind of what are the fears and expectations and things and, and goals that, that they have. Uh, so uh, instead of kind of trying to you know, push our, our learners or our teachers to the place where we want them to be, you know, because we know we know better. This is very much kind of like trying to work in partnership with these stakeholders and try to see, you know, kind of what are their goals and what are our goals and kind of where do those two fit together um, to something that's going to, you know, benefit, benefit both. Okay, on to our third tool. Um, now we're on the second group. These are tools for co-design. Um, the first set of tools have to do with authentic ideation. Um, and um, these are tools for creativity and to deal with some of the barriers that we can find uh, with co-creation. Um, creativity is of course super important if we're gonna be co-designing. Part of what we want to bring there is not just um, the user and their ideas, but hopefully you know, have um, some of these um, stakeholders actually have ownership into into the tools that we are that we are creating, um, and this sounds really challenging. Something that, that learn, like learning analytics, right? Because it's so sophisticated uh, and where there's a lot of uh, uh, complex information. But actually, the tools that we're going to talk about right now deal with with some of that complexity. Now, the first issue of complexity is, I would say, social complexity, right? Um, we as the research designers are probably, you know, teachers or faculty or administrators and our stakeholders come from another part of the universities or the educational institutions that we are working with. You know, they are advisors and, and there's probably some level of just distrust and or hierarchy. Um, universities are very hierarchical. So um, 
for, for everybody to be creative, actually, you need to deal with some of those barriers. Um, and, uh, and how do we deal with this? Trying to create um, learning and, and design experiences that are playful and, and, um, and you know, um, that, that just bring some of the um, silliness that of, of the world of creativity. Um, <clears throat> so the first kind of uh, set of challenges that we're dealing here with um, is challenges about power and balance. Um, and the first thing that we need to do here is to simply address them. When we are working with students or working with teachers, kind of, you know, address the positionality of everybody and, and also very explicitly address the fact that we, um, that we can all fail. And, and there's, there's actual literature uh, that I put here <laughs> that I need to cite and that I can share uh, with you guys later um, about, about the impact of, um, <clears throat> Of, of simply acknowledging the fact that, that, uh, that us as teachers are fallible human beings when we are trying to design for, for creativity. Humor and vulnerability um, are also really uh, powerful tools. Um, like, you know, if you have breaks within your systems, using those spaces to just socialize and share stories of times when you as a facilitator had something that was a little bit embarrassing or, or you know, uh, that can make people laugh, but also kind of like lowers you down on there on uh, lo just, just lowers your guard um, before, your, before your users. Uh, all those things are actually very powerful, just kind of relaxing people. Um, <clears throat> this is, you know, uh, another set of pictures from, uh, from another uh, session. Um, and what you see there are just kind of a bunch of different uh, students working through number of, of um, icebreaker challenges. Um, and icebreakers are what we usually cut from sessions, right? When, when we have very little time, um, the first thing to go is, you know, that thing that we're going to build uh, to, to get everybody relaxed. But the truth is that they are essential to, um, to get everybody on the same page and to start creating a learning community before we're going to ask that learning community to create something together. Um, so what they're doing there on the, on the left is, you know, one of these uh, human tangles where like everybody just grabs their hands and then they have to figure out how to get um, out of this tangle. Um, and the one on the right, um, well, that doesn't matter, it's a different exercise. But um, the important thing is that, you know, here you, people, students are touching each other. Um, you know, us as researchers, we're in those tangles as well. So all of a sudden, everybody's just like on the same page and we can start building uh, on from that. Um, the second uh, is just a, a series of just ideas of kind of like try to learn how to stimulate creativity. For example, um, when we are getting people to have ideas, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this concept, but the brain literally has two different modes of functioning, um, uh, divergent thinking and convergent thinking. And, and, and even at like a, a neural uh, level, um, these two processes look different. Uh, convergent thinking is when you are judging, uh, when you are trying to get the right answer uh, or a good answer. So if you're looking for a good idea, you're actually using your convergent mind because you're trying to come up with an idea, but you're judging it at the same time. Um, divergent thinking um, is actually when your brain is trying to just create um, connections. So um, divergent thinking works best when you actually suspend your judgment. And getting um, your your stakeholders to, um, to, to realize that these are two different processes and to use each one of these parts of their brain kind of like at the right moment is, is very important. So say what we want to do is create ideas, encourage them to come up with silly, weird ideas. Um, one really good uh, technique is to try to aim for, um, you know, go for, <clears throat> sorry, aim for a number of ideas instead of, a, instead of actually aiming for good ideas. And then separate that process of coming up with ideas with a different process that is convergent where you will actually judge those ideas and choose from these many ideas that have been generated, weird, strange, you know, freakish ideas, but then actually you're gonna look at them and see which ones of them are, are good. Um, and uh, yeah, the more, the more you can make this uh, just childlike and, and, and fanciful, um, the better it is. Uh, here, by the way, is kind of like one uh, one set of of, uh, of rules um, that 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 we always put in our in our sessions. You know, like don't criticize, build on each other's ideas, 
get the conversation going, stay focused. And, and just having that there um, just you know, makes us all have agreement of what the rules of the space are so we can create together. On to our fourth tool. Um, <clears throat> are we doing the time? Okay, we're kind of okay still. So um, this is really interesting. Scaffolding databases thinking with cards and other tools. Okay, so um, as I mentioned before, and, and as you, I'm sure you all know, one of the challenges that we have as learning analytics uh, designers who want to do human-centered design is the barrier of knowledge between kind of us with our technical knowledge and the students, teachers, and other stakeholders that we will be working with. So um, what these are, are just like a series of tools that allow us to scaffold that knowledge or allow these stakeholders to participate authentically, um, creating things um, through these tools that, that we have that we have used that we're using to help them know some of that technical knowledge. Um, so one example is cards that have appropriate questions, concepts, or ideas in learning analytics. Um, recently, and, and I put this in the bibliography, uh, there's some really interesting work on something called the LA deck. That's just like a deck of cards that have different concepts of learning analytics. And um, users put these cards together to create um, ideas. Um, relevant mapping activities can be uh, can be another another tool, um, and and what this is, you know, say if you have a uh, a space of of different types of data, for example, that that are going to be involved in a project, um, you can work with your stakeholders and start you know start asking them, okay, what types of data do you think would be interesting for the solution? For example, uh, let me choose one of your projects. Uh, here says a recommender system for courses in enrollment. So you have a recommender system. Um, you know what types of data you have and maybe have a, a theory about what types of data you might need. But instead of simply presenting this to your stakeholders, in the workshop, you can, you can get them to ask, you know, kind of, okay, what data do you guys think, you know, we want to, we, we are all together in knowing, in, in knowing that we want to build this recommender system. What types of data do you think might be useful for this? And with everybody kind of ideating and building this, uh, this data mapping, uh, this, this data, sorry, uh, cartography together, uh, you're basically kind of bringing their input, you're empowering them, making them feel that they know about data. Um, you'll be actually surprised about how much, you know, they might know, not know the technical terms of each type of data that you have available, but they get a sense of, you know, kind of what types of tracking there are. Um, and it will start a conversation about, you know, what is the data that's available? Um, why is this data available? Sometimes it can lead to conversations about ethics, for example, and, and what we should see and what maybe we shouldn't see um, as researchers. Um, and, and you get everybody on the same page and we all have now an image of, you know, of, of what this complex uh, tapestry of data is. Um, now, a tool that we created um, is, uh, is this tool of, uh, just cards for thinking um, about learning analytics with, with students. And uh, so I'm gonna jump to the, to the last one. Um, we used this in, in our series of workshops at Learn. Um, and the challenge again that we had was, you know, students don't necessarily know all of the nuanced ways in which a tool can, can act uh, to, to improve a student's experience. So what, uh, what these cards are, there are just three types of cards. Um, there's, there's green cards that essentially kind of have a suggestion of what a learning analytics tool maybe might do or, or kind of what is a need that a tool might respond to, like, you know, how you could learn something in your university. Um, what mistakes have you committed as a student? Um, what other mistakes uh, others, other students may have committed? Um, what order you did things in a class? Um, how interested you are in a class? You know, all these things that maybe we can get data uh, to give us an answer. Then we have the blue, uh, the blue cards, which are verbs. So, you know, something that illustrates or connects you to, or to helps you understand. And then kind of like as a bonus, we had red cards, which were um, terms that were related to usability and design, like, you know, beauty, interest, motivation, um, you know, follow through, etc. And what we would get students to do is to just randomly assign these cards together, just like grab one blue card, grab one green card, put them together and see if they make sense. So something, you know, they would get to combinations like, you know, you can create a tool that helps you with what topics you feel confident with in this course. And, and they would just randomly go through these combinations until they got to a combination 
that made sense to them, that resonated with them as, as a stakeholder themselves or um, with the stakeholder that they had created with their persona. Um, and once they said, okay, cool, I, I have a combination that makes sense, they would start designing and try to come up with 10 or 15 ideas of a learning analytics tool that could, that could do something for this person. Um, if they were running out of kind of uh, creative juice, then they, they could grab one of the red cards and, and it would bring a term like social. Oh, okay, cool. Now I was thinking about this in this way. Now maybe I'm going to start thinking about what are the social components uh, that, can, that, can, that can help uh, uh, an, an idea like this. And um, here's another combination. You know, here's a tool that would illustrate what were your mistakes in some space and what others and what mistakes did others commit. And uh, the, the, the kind of UX challenge here is how do we make this cool? Um, again, um, this, this led our students to, to come up with some really, really interesting ideas. And, and again, this first level of, of creativity, they just came up with a lot of ideas. A lot of them were bad ideas and that's, and that's fine. You know, in another phase, we just um, looked at these many, many ideas that they had created and then they would hierarchize the ideas that they thought had most promise. And then we would all speak together and choose some of those ideas that, that we thought were kind of really interesting and pro prototype them and flesh them out and try them out to see whether they could become tools in, in reality. Okay. Um, sorry, the activity is way back here. Um, I, again, I'm going to give you guys uh, three minutes and um, yeah, just choose one of these tools for one of your projects. Um, you know, uh, does, does uh, canvas mapping uh, make sense? Um, does uh, ideation tools make sense? Uh, do a card system would make sense? And if, and if you were going to build a card deck, what components would that have? Like what types of information should your stakeholder have? Um, maybe they start, start trying to design, you know, this, uh, an answer for your problem. Um, by the way, that card deck, it took us, you know, two days to build it. it it's, it's very easy to just make it on paper and it had a huge impact in the design later on. Um, so again, I'm going to give you guys three minutes and feel free to ask questions while we, while we do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look for the quantified methodology in the meantime, yes. JP, can I just direct another question toward you from the uh, chat form? Yes, please. Um, so the question is, does data literacy matter at this level? Do you introduce some sorts of information about data to students? Um, it depends on what, what your objectives are. Um, so my experience with students has been that they actually know way more um, than you would assume that they know. Um, they're, uh, there, in this case in particular, actually, uh, we didn't need to explain anything regarding the data. Um, uh, they had a lot of questions, you know, kind of about like, are, is, for example, like, is this data being tracked or is that data being tracked? And then we could answer them based on the knowledge that we had. So the data literacy was actually being built through the process itself. We didn't really need to kind of, you know, go and teach them about kind of data literacy. Um, so um, if you are, if you're talking about really, really uh, kind of, I mean, the other thing is that they, they, they get a sense of kind of how many of these algorithms work just by the interaction um, with uh, social media and, you know, TikTok and Instagram. Um, it's very much part of the culture right now. Um, if you're working with good students, they will, again, 
they probably won't know the nuances of uh, of each of these things, and they they might blue skies kind of like think about an idea of something that that is way beyond our capabilities or just you know our price tag um, for building. But uh, that is not necessarily a bad thing, right? You know, you you, you hear uh, what ideas they come with with their limited data literacy, um, but then you as a designer can work in adapting that. Um, what one thing that we did actually was to have a designer in the room and and have them adapt in vivo some of the ideas that they were coming up with so students would you know say this is what i'm thinking about um they would discuss with the designer sometimes the designer who also knew about data would you know say okay um what about this instead of that because that is something that we can actually build and they would be like oh yeah you know and that would start a discussion and then the designer would actually prototype a first or second version um, of their idea that became an object to to um to develop with with uh, with the students themselves. Okay, I still I can't find that um, here. Great. Okay, just found it. Okay. Um, I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll share the the quantified personas thing in a, in a minute because we have to uh, go on and we just have ten minutes left. Okay. Um, JP, um, another quick point yes. on quantified self, just so you're aware. Um, if uh, and for others as well, if you have anything you want to share after the event, we'll put everything into the Learning Analytics Learning Network site, where we keep recordings and uh, slides and supporting resources. So uh, we'll share that with everybody that attended the session via email after. Um, absolutely. And, and, you know, I found the paper, I'll just put it here like, in, in a minute or two. Um, okay, uh, tool number five. Um, this is a really interesting one. It's called speed dating. Um, <clears throat> so what it is, is a method to go quickly through prototypes and get feedback. So from a session like the one that I described, you know, maybe a lot of ideas came out of them. And you, know, you have 20, 30, 40, 50 ideas, and, and, and some of them might have sub, sub ideas, right? You have like this idea for a dashboard, but you know, there's different affordances um, or parts of that dashboard that you're not sure we need all of them or which are the ones that have the most value with our stakeholders. Um, so speed dating is a methodology that allows you to, to, to get a sense of what the value of these many ideas are from stakeholders and actually sometimes even build more ideas from uh, these interactions. Um, and how it works, um, it's, it's actually pretty simple. You create some sort of artifact that represents your idea in, in a visual manner. Some, some, some artifact that allows you to understand the idea quickly. Um, a storyboard, for example, is, is, is one way or a visual representation of your idea. And then you bring a group of stakeholders um, and often individually, you just show them these ideas one by one and you give them a couple of minutes to give you quick feedback about how they feel about the idea. Um, so here's an example about uh, speed dating from Holstein, McLaren and, and Alvin um, from a great, great paper from 2019. Uh, this is uh, the Journal of Learning Analytics and uh, Holstein has been doing research for this tool called Lumilo that allows um, teachers to kind of see, uh, have a third eye um, regarding how a student is, is uh, how, how different students are working with this learning tool in their classroom. They, they, they put on essentially Google glasses and, and this gives them like um, extra information of their students in the classroom itself. Um, and what we have here are just three ways, uh, three visualizations that they created really quickly in Photoshop. You know, none of this is, uses any real data. Um, <clears throat> about how the tool would look like in reality. So, you know, the, the teacher would put on his glasses and they would see these kind of, you know, hands that are there like on the, on the virtual space. Um, or, or they would see uh, kind of like some data of some of the things that were kind of working or not working according to the data that the system was receiving from their interactions um, with the learning management system. Or uh, they would be getting alerts of a student that was, you know, doing something that they shouldn't be doing. Um, so these were just three features of many that they ideated. They would just, you know, bring teachers, give them all of these different cards, and they would, you know, look at one image, look at the next one, and give them rapid feedback. Um, out of these sessions, they got a lot of information about what were the things that were really valuable and useful, and what were some features that were, you know, more of a nice to have. Um, okay. Uh, Small activity um, for this. Um, again, I'm going to give you guys three minutes. And with this tool that you are thinking, you know, you probably have already an idea of what this tool might be. 
Um, think about one or two features and one or two use cases. So a use case is essentially, what is the challenge that this thing is solving and how is it solving that challenge and what happens after? For example, um, you know, students uh, don't know which resource from the many resources in the classroom is most valuable. This tool tells them which resource was most valuable for students in the past semester. And with that, the student can actually study better um, for, for his tests and, and, and spend more time on that reading as opposed to the other readings. So that's like a small, a small use case. Try to think about one use case um, for, for the tools that you're creating. I'm gonna give you guys three minutes. Meanwhile, I'm gonna look for the citation here. Okay, I see a message over here. Somebody says that they would love to use uh, the cards for their stakeholders. Um, when we when we share the PowerPoint, um, that PowerPoint is going to have an actual link uh, both to the LA deck um, from Carlos Prieto Alvarez um, from from Australia um, and uh, and also from from a PDF uh, of the cards that we created. Uh, and feel free to grab that and you know adapt it to your needs, the questions and and kind of types of things that you should be in those cards. I'm going to be very different um, depending on your reality. Okay, um, great. So I'm now moving to uh, the sixth tool. Uh, somebody here, by the way, was was mentioning how. Um, oh, they put a deck in there. That's great. Um, and somebody here was saying how how maybe we shouldn't start with data um, for for actually getting to know the students. And and I and I very much agree with that. I think the quantified persona thing can be a, a good add-on tool, but not necessarily where you want to start. Um, interacting with, with humans, with real stakeholders have a, has a great value in challenging some of our perceptions and, and some of our um, yeah, presuppositions about, about these stakeholders. Um, okay, so we have another um, set of, of cards. Uh, these are very simple to use and have uh, a lot of value. Um, so the, the challenge here, here is um, that um, uh, for usability, right? Um, many of you may have conducted usability interviews when you bring users in and they either, you know, run through a prototype or they test a prototype and, and, you, have, and you have them share um, their opinions and their impressions of this thing that you created with you. Um, and it's great. It brings you a lot of really, really uh, cool information. But the challenge is, you know, these interviews go for long. Um, you might end up with 20, 30, 50 pages of trans that um, kind of make it, make it 
challenging and believe you have to spend a lot of time parsing what, what this information is and what it means for your project. Um, so what this tool does is that it adds a quantifiable component to make it easier to clarify from stakeholder interviews when they are testing a prototype. This is ridiculously simple. Um, so what you do is when you bring the stakeholders um, to talk about the prototype, you create a set of cards that has a number of uh, what they're called UX terms. And, and you can literally Google this and it will show up um, that, uh, that, that represent some of the, uh, of the ways that they might feel about your, 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 um, your tool. Things like uh, it's usable, it's beautiful, it's practical, it's valuable, or on the, on the flip side, uh, it's cumbersome, it's confusing, um, it, uh, it uses a lot of time, just kind of like small ideas of things that you have a sense that might be going well or that might be, might be challenging with what you're creating. Um, and as they are discussing, you have them actually choose, say, um, okay, we have this deck of eight or nine cards and they can see all of the cards. And to facilitate the discussion, you ask them to actually choose three or four of these cards and then start describing to you their experience, uh, the product that you have created. Um, this is an example um, of uh, how these cards were used by um, Megala Mbogo. Um, I'm sorry, must have completely butchered uh, that name. And they had, uh, if I'm not mistaken, six terms uh, that, of, of, that were positive, uh, you know, use, usability positive, and, and uh, three or four that were usability negative. Um, and after this, you know, um, when they had interviewed 20 or 30 teachers for their tool, they got a really kind of good sense just, you know, before starting anything about kind of how uh, they, they, they sensed um, that this tool was working. Just by the, the cards that they had chosen, for their interviews, you essentially get like a first survey that allows you to get like a high level view about you know how how they were feeling about the tool that they had created. You know, a lot of people found it useful, motivating, um, not very sophisticated, not very time consuming, pretty good on the easy to use and adaptable. Um, so it allows you to have a quantified component on something that tends to be uh, more on the qualitative things. You know, the interview becomes also a, a survey, so to speak. All right, um, so we are right in time. Our plan today was to talk about these uh, six tools uh, on the understanding level. We talked about contextual inquiry. We talked about how to create personas and how to co-construct them with our users. Um, we talked about tools for co-design, uh, for authentic ideation and how to, how to stimulate the creativity of our um, users um, and uh, also how to work with co-design cards that scaffolded some of those challenges in terms of just data literacy and, and technological complexity uh, and tools for ideating such as speed dating and uh, these usability cards that allow you to have a quantified component um, on, on qualitative interviews. Um, that's all. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna uh, leave this here in case you guys have time, but uh, I would love you to, to go through the Jamboard um, as we're maybe answering questions after the session and just kind of like maybe order your thoughts and take a screenshot um, and uh, add one or two things and, and think about, I don't know, what could be a three-step participa participatory design process for your next uh, learning analytics project? Um, and with that, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, this is uh, my email and feel free to you know, send me questions, ask for resources, um, and I hope this, this was useful for you. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, Juan. That was a great overview and a very practical illustrations and raised some good questions as well about the relationships between what we want to drive from data, what we want to uh, extract, if you will, from literature, and uh, as one uh, individual shared, also what we want to get directly from the users and the students that participate in the tools and the projects that we're doing. So thank you for an informative chat. Uh, a re really good presentation. I also want to draw everyone's attention to, uh, we do have upcoming uh, sessions. We have two coming up in the short term. Uh, you may find uh, both of these to be of interest. I'm just going to drop the link in so you can feel free to register for those events. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier on with Learning Analytics Learning Network, our primary motivation is just to create a space for researchers and others to experience and encounter new approaches, new concepts, new areas of learning analytics that they might find useful either to start getting involved in the community, to upgrade their skills, or just to be aware of what people are thinking and talking about. Upcoming we have, um, it is, uh, what's our next date here? The 23rd of February, uh, we have an event uh, by Abelardo Pardo that's looking at personalized feedback. This comes out of an extensive research project that he's run for a number of years now uh, on task, which is an attempt to create adaptive personalized feedback and do so at scale. And some promising research results that have come out of that. Then we have coming early March, uh, an event by uh, you know, a colleague uh, uh, from uh, University of South Australia. Uh, he's looking at the open science research practices in the area in the era of big data. The reason I think this is an important talk as well is it focuses on challenges that fields like psychology have faced around methodology and research challenges and the way that they responded. And if the learning analytics community and field is aware of some of these challenges and informed about what was resolved in other communities, the opportunity then exists to sort of circumvent or shortcut those mistakes by adopting some of the methodological innovations to ensure rigor, replication, and uh, just quality research as a whole. So join Fernando for that event in, in, uh, in March. And then we also have an upcoming uh, LAC21 workshop, which will be done online and we'll share more details about that going forward. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, great to have uh, you involved and uh, expect to see more ongoing events being shared with, with the broad community. And thanks, JP, for a terrific talk again.